This is the Comics Alternative Interviews, another conversation with Sophie Goldstein. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek. And I'm Paul, and we're two academics talking about comics. That's right. And on this interview episode, we have the pleasure of talking with Sophie Goldstein. Her new book, House of Women, came out last week from Fantagraphics. But before we get to that fun conversation, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews is brought to you by the wonderful folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off of the cover price, sometimes 50% off of the cover, but every now and again you can find discounts that are more impressive than that. One of the ways that you can take advantage, maximal advantage, of DCBS's incredible discounts is to take a look at the bundles that they have on offer every month. This month, October, is no exception. You'll find bundles there that will save you 50% off on uh, Marvel Legacy titles, Valiant titles, DC Young Animal titles. You, there's even a bundle for Marvel Legacy lenticular variants, if that's your thing. Um, but you can also find uh, a, a great deal of other bundles uh, at uh, as much as 50% off. And so it's a tremendous discount and a great way to take advantage of DCBS's um, deep discounts at Great Comics. That's right. You know, you can't go wrong with the discounts at Discount Comic Book Service because discount is in their name. Right. That's DC. <laughs> yeah, that's DCBService.com. Go there for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your titles there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs or the two academics sent you. <laughs> That's right. Please do. Yes. You'll have your PhD soon. I'm very close. <laughs> very close. So, Paul, this was, uh, this was a fun time interviewing Sophie Goldstein. Um, now, we've had her on the Comics Alternative a few times in the past. I interviewed mm -hmm. her one-on-one -on -one about a couple of years ago, and our listeners can do a search on our website uh, to find that one. Uh, mm -hmm. But I've also talked with her a couple of times at Small Press Expo Cons, mm -hmm. and then Andy Kunkka more recently interviewed her. Uh, and her significant other in mm -hmm. Sumter at that uh, uh, comics fair that he has down there. Yeah. Um, but, but this was special because now we have the completed House of Women, which she has been publishing over the past, what, four years or so, mm -hmm. in installment, self-publishing. Now we have this new book from Fantagraphics, and it was really good to get her to talk about the process of creating this entire narrative. Absolutely. I mean, the great thing about having um, a, such a long prior relationship is that we've been able to hear about um, Sophie's work. And and then so when we talked about House of Women, I thought that we got to, you know, go pretty deep into process and her thinking behind the work. I think the conversation is a great um, like commentary track to have beside you if you've uh, read the book or to go pick up the book and then listen to Sophie uh, talk about it uh, or the other way around, whatever order you want to do it. But I so enjoyed just kind of getting deep into her art style, the, the you know, different corners of the story. And uh, it was great fun to do this, Derek. Yes, it was. Uh, so let's go ahead and give our listeners the opportunity to listen to what we talked about. Yep. We're pleased to have back on the Comics Alternative, Sophie Goldstein. Her new book, House of Women, was released last week from Fantagraphics. Sophie, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, we're so excited. Uh, this is Paul, <laughs> and I'm a huge fan of your work, so glad that, that we could have this conversation. You know, Sophie, you've, uh, you've been on the show a few times. I know that uh, about two years ago... 
I interviewed you one on one about I think this is right after or soon after the second volume of your self-published House of Women came out, and we talked for a while about that. And then I've talked with you at a couple of small press expo events, and then more recently, Andy Kunkka <laughs> tried mm-hmm. to, to talk with and record a conversation with you when you went down to, to Sumter. Uh, and uh, that, that was an interesting recording in that he put, I, I'm sure you heard it, uh, where he put his phone in the middle of the table, didn't he? And you had yeah, all of that. Yeah, at the Waffle House. Yeah, and you had all that ambient uh, sound. But, uh, but yeah, the, the sound quality on this interview is going to be quite a bit better, we promise. Yeah, but that was so much fun. <laughs> well, well, you had waffles, so we can't provide well, that for this love. kind of interview. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we can't do that with uh, this interview. But uh, feel free to eat as you're talking. Mm, mm-hmm. Well, you know, Sophie, I, I want to start off by asking you about House of Women. Now, many of our readers may not know about this story. And so I'm wondering if you could maybe tell us a couple of things. One, introduce the story, you know, you know, just in a nutshell to our listeners. Uh, but also, we'd be interested in knowing where this idea came from, its genesis, its roots. Um, yeah, so House of Women is, uh, I, I've gotten to do this pitch a bunch now because I've done the mini comics over the past few years and now the book's out. So I usually, depending on the person standing at the table, I tell them it's a uh, psychosexual sci-fi horror <laughs> po- <a> post-colonialist narrative <laughs> uh, with weird aliens. Uh, so that's one, that's one pitch. And then the other one that I tell people, which is more story based is that uh, it's about four women from a large intergalactic organization that go to this remote planet uh, to start a school with the idea of indoctrinating the native population in their larger culture. Um, and uh, they are ill-prepared for what awaits them. Hmm. <laughs> uh, and the genesis for the story comes from uh, a movie, actually. I, um, in 2012, I guess, uh, I saw this movie, Black Narcissus. Uh, oh. which is a, uh, it was made in 1947. Um, it was a Powell Pressburger production, and it's about these uh, group of five nuns that go to the Himalayan mountains mm. to, uh, and they take over this old, uh, it's not a nun, it's um, where the Sultan kept his ladies, his harem house, mm. essentially. Mm. The harem and, house. <laughs> yes, uh, and they uh, start a school for uh, for children and women. Um, and it, it, so it's the basic, the broader plot points are very similar in House of Women, only, of course, it's not science fiction. So any of the those elements are things that I've added. And, that, and there is like some, that's where this story kind of, my story takes its own turn mm. uh, away from the narrative of Black Narcissus. But I, I saw Black Narcissus and it's like this very, stylized heightened crazy kind of movie about like female desire and Mm. colonialism and like all this sort of stuff. And there was just something in that mix that was very, um, that I really wanted to play with. Mm. Hmm. Yeah. That, that I thought the premise was totally fascinating. You know, those missionary narratives take you to a place where all those, um, uh, you know, if you're an interplanetary nun, <laughs> you're, you're sort of, um, you know, those boundaries of morality or, or what's right and wrong, you know, when put in that missionary setting, uh, everything kind of gets pushed and tested. In a certain, it, it's something about like Barbara King Solver novels or, or even mm. um, Joseph Conrad stuff that I love. I, and I thought it was so fascinating and also so Sophie Goldstein to add the sci-fi, <laughs> you know, to add the sci-fi to that tension and complexity. So I'm I'm really curious what the sci-fi setting provided you in um in 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 telling the story. Well, one of the reasons I really like science fiction uh, or to do science, like I think with House of Women, um, there are some very clear story elements that come from the science fiction setting and the fact that the their colonial 
colonizing an alien planet with an alien population. Uh, but when I was doing the oven, like I did, uh, at one point I was still in white river junction. And so I had the, the script for the story and I asked Jason Lutz, um, to give me some feedback on it. Um, I had graduated from that point, but when he asked me like, well, why is this a science fiction story? Like, you know, you could, you can make it very easily make it not a science fiction story with just a couple adjustments. And that, yeah. and I just, uh, I, the only answer that I really have is like science fiction is what I do. It's how I think. And I really like the freedom it gives me to like tweak elements of the world to like heighten certain aspects of the story. Sure. Um, so with house of women with the aliens, I think that they're uh, being able to, they have a, a very big gender despair, uh, sexual disparity between the females of the species and the males of the species. Right, right. And I think getting to play with that was very interesting. And like, there's a central plot point that comes from their physiology. Right. And then also, uh, when you're talking about a colonialist narrative, like obviously colonialism comes with a ton of baggage. And I think that um, that having them be aliens uh, both pushes that even further. Yeah. And then also like, you know, you're not, you're not treating like uh, the <laughs> big problem that people have with heart of darkness is it basically like treats uh, the Congo natives as yeah. like uh, the subconscious of a white man, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? So I was trying to like, uh, sidestep some of those issues of colonialism while still getting to deal with like those aspects of a colonial narrative. I mean, it's right. like a very delicate yeah. territory to be yeah. honest. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it comes off really effectively um, in sort of like mimicking all of those components of the colonial situation. But um, uh, uh, you know, sci-fi is all, uh, all about possibility, right? And alternatives, and uh, you employ those really well, I think. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you guys were talking about um, your penchant for science fiction, and that's one of the things I've noticed about your work. I mean, not just in House of Women, which does have that kind of science fiction-y feel to it, but you get something similar in your previous book that, you know, we, we actually discussed on the Comics Alternative a few years ago, The Oven, and also a number of your other comics, you know, many of which have appeared online in various places, like, you know, 500 Days to Mars, Food chain mm -hmm. um mother kind of fantastical if not science fictiony um and it i mean there some of your narratives and, and i'm thinking of maybe strands mm -hmm. um are a little more realistic anniversary more gothic than anything but the vast majority of your stories are of the fantastical or science fiction school. And so I'm wondering why you tend to gravitate toward those kind of, you know, broad genres instead of more, let's say, realistic slice of life kind of storytelling. Um, I don't know. I think that's a difficult question to answer because, you know, it's, I don't sit when I'm generating a story, it's not as if I sit down and be, and like, like decide like which of these genres am I going to choose today? <laughs> right. um, mm -hmm. The story ideas just kind of come bubble up from, you know, the weird mixture of influences that I have going on inside, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. With a, some, you know, like sometimes they're determined by the shape of the vessel. So like, uh, for example, the anniversary, which you mentioned was a short story for sleep of reason, which was a horror anthology. So, Okay. You know, it's a horror comic. Um, and with, uh, you know, and, and for the work I've done for the nib, you know, I, I illustrated that um, 500 days to Mars piece. And then I did um, a piece on minimalism downsizing like those um, can are more based in <laughs> reality. I mean, they're not and they're nonfiction more or less or a nonfiction essay because like that's what the nib publishes. Um, so but for my own, for my own work, I don't know. It's just, uh, the science fiction ideas that I have, I always find to be more interesting and exciting to me. Mm -hmm. And then, um, like I said, it just, it allows me to like push 
the situation of the characters a little further, you know, like you can kind of construct a reality um, or construct a, an environment that allows you to almost, almost like, like, you know, pinpoint position, uh, go into a certain social issue or mm-hmm. a certain psychological issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that that's what I find really interesting about, um, about science fiction stories. Mm-hmm. You know, like I think if you think about, um, really good science fiction comics or movies or stories, uh, there's always some sort of message about or thing that they're examining. Like I just saw this movie, Marjorie prime. Have you guys seen that? Mm -mm, No. So Marjorie prime, uh, I I might still be in theaters. I saw it at a local cinema, uh, like indie cinema here. And the idea is that, uh, that, so they create these holographic representations of people who have passed away. And, um, and in one case, the representation is for this older woman. It's of her dead husband. It's to help her, like, prompt her memory because she's, you know, has, like, uh, Alzheimer's. Um, and then in another case, there's another one that's uh, to help this woman process her morning basically Mm -hmm. and so um i feel like that could that construct it's not really about that technology although it is a little bit examining like you know how does it feel to have something that looks like someone and feels acts like someone but isn't a person but i think a lot of it's about mourning and memory Mm -hmm. You know, mm. so um, and I think those to me are the most in, p- interesting kind of narratives. They aren't about the tech, uh, science fiction narratives. They aren't about the technology. Right. They're about uh, the human, the human feelings, the, like the universal human experience. Mm. You know, something that you mentioned a little while ago is um, you said when you first started writing House of Women, uh, one of your colleagues had mentioned, you know, why is this science fiction? You could do something like this. Um, outside of the science fiction genre and, you, you know, using the sci-fi tropes and whatnot. Um, you know, that, that's the way that I see House of Women in that, yeah, it, I mean, it does have this science fiction feel to it. Um, but this story could be told outside of that genre without any science fiction references. And I think that's one of the things that really drives the story of House of Women. And I'm thinking in particular of not just the relationship among the three missionaries, Sarai, Kizzy, Rivka, and Afra, mm. but how they're each different from the other. And in certain ways, they complement one another. But in other ways, especially with the character Rivka, um, it produces tensions. And, uh, and I really do appreciate this difference of character of these four missionaries. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, oh, stupid phone. Um, <laughs> I think that one of the things when I was, so the first volume of House of Women was done for my thesis project for the Center for Cartoon Studies. Mm. So I had a longer than typical amount of time to develop it. Mm. Um, so I spent, you know, I did a bunch of like character studies and like style studies and things. Mm. Um, but I also... Like I, um, each of the char- I d- designed each of the characters to be kind of aligned with an element. Um, so uh, Sarai, the protagonist, is water. Um, Rivka, who I, I, the antagonist, I I guess <laughs> is uh, is fire, and right. Kizzy's air, and Afra's wood. Mm. And um, it doesn't really enter. It's like not something that I think is important for the reader to notice. Um, which is good because I don't think readers do, but it did guide my design, my design, physical design of the characters. And I think also expressed like a certain internal aspects of them. And then as I, I think it did inform my drawing of the book because you do kind of like have scenes where you see each of these characters in their elements. Um, Mm. And Mm. there is a lot of scenes with Sarai and water um, and uh she does come from like a a very watery planet essentially, which you can kind of like get in the little hints of her backstory. Afra who, uh, whose element is wood, like she 
um, comes from a planet with enormous trees. Um, and she has like, I think a very tree like (laughs) solidity about her. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that helped me kind of think about the characters and have them like have them very distinct personalities. Um, and they are kind of, they are archetypes. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, like they're, I think that even though I, in the, if you watch Black Narcissist, I think that is even more so. Like, I think those characters, like, are even pushed more in the direction of to where they're not very relatable as people. Like, Mm. they just feel like very broad stereotypes. And that's kind of what that movie is working with. And I wanted Mm. the characters to be a little bit more empathetic or that you as a reader would be able to empathize with them a little bit yeah. more mm. so than that. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I guess it's really, I'm not sure who a reader, like Sarah is the viewpoint character, but I right. don't like think that she's a likable person. Mm. So I don't know who, I guess a reader ends up kind of empathizing with, uh, I mean, hopefully Zaza and Kizzy would kind of be, uh, the characters that I hope the reader would like. <laughs> yeah. And Elijah, because Elijah's great. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm. it, you know, it's interesting. I hadn't thought about Sarai, Kizzy, Rivka, and Afra as representing the four four different elements. And it, it makes sense now that you, you say this. And I'm thinking of that significant scene at the end of part one where these four missionaries – are kind of taking it easy. They're by the river or lake, mm. and uh, Sarai swims off, um, you know, just to, you know, swim and just be free. And she ends up seeing Jail Dean with, I, I don't know, I, I guess, is that Zaza? No, it's or one it's, of the native women. But it's, yeah, it's, it's another one of the, the natives of that planet. And so that's shocking to her. But what's even more shocking is the fact that she sees Rivka spying on JL Dean. And she doesn't know what to do with this information. And when the last panel of part one is Sarai kind of just floating in the water and uh looking surprised and so i mean that that's an important moment in the narrative and with you saying that sarai is associated with water now it makes even more sense Mm. this Mm. particular scene yeah i really wanted that scene um those very early on i wanted a scene of these women hanging out (laughs) at a watering hole i don't know why but it's just very (laughs) important to me to have it um and uh, and I really love, like I was uh, referencing a lot of Art Nouveau, and uh, there's a lot of interesting representations of water in Art Nouveau, and I wanted to play with that, um, which is another reason why I end up writing so many water scenes into the book, because I really love drawing and uh, inking those textures. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, the, I think it's it's implied that they come from a pretty um, repressive culture. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um and so the idea of uh, Yael, I, I say Yael, I don't, it's not mm. important, um, <laughs> okay, uh, that, he, that he like has essentially, uh, you know, in quotes, gone native mm-hmm. um, is, uh, is disturbing to her because, you know, because of all the usual reasons that you think it's like um, both that they, that he's, spoiler alert, that he's having sex with uh, an alien species Right. Um, which is kind of like a contamination narrative. And then also that he, you know, is potentially just exploiting these, these aliens, like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, both of both aspects of which are very troubling to her. Mm. Mm. Yeah. You mentioned, so you pronounce Yale Dean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned him and earlier you made reference to heart of darkness. I, I think he is the best heart of darkness reference in House of Women, for for the reasons that you mentioned that he that he did go native, and and I'm wondering what are your attitudes toward that character, J. L. Dean? I mean, what did you come up with him and his personality and what he ends up doing? Mm. Uh, so in he is based on a character in Black Narcissus. Um, there's the same last name, Mister Mister Dean, um, mm. who's like this 
English dude who uh, who's in commerce and lives out there and um, has basically like you know like is the antagonist to these nuns and that he is walking around without his shirt on all the time and like hanging out <laughs> with native women and like all that sort of stuff. So he's the he's the basic like premise for uh, for Yael. The, the the difference was is that I you know I also wanted to give Yael like a a visual indication that he had gone native in some way and that's why he has like the double eye set mm-hmm. um and mm-hmm. there's a scene where afra um kind of Im- implies that it's because you know because he has this re- reprehensible past in some way mm-hmm. um but i don't know like for i just i think he's he's not a character that i want the reader to really identify with he's like a hunky guy that just throws (laughs) a wrench into the works right um so that's basically his function like in and of himself Hmm. he isn't really there isn't that much to him he's just something for these women to have these different feelings about right right yeah yeah i think i think he's a fantastic creation um i don't know if this was intentional but you know, he his swagger, there's a little bit of a, a James Dean and there's a little bit of assonance with the name as well. And I couldn't help but associate that with um, Marlon Brando wandering around the island. I mean, that fits well with the uh, Apocalypse Now, Heart <laughs> of Darkness <laughs> connection too, you know, but uh, but with four eyes. But, the, you know, there's something too that there's, um, uh, the words I thought of was a lot of menace in, in him. Uh and but also like a blend of menace and charisma that just you know what those char- what those actors make me think of and what that character makes me think of but i, I was thinking about that as like i definitely don't identify with um with this character uh having only two eyes and you know <laughs> generally wearing a shirt uh as i do <laughs> but i i did think that um you know the the element that he brings is to take this chemistry of these four uh, really well crafted character, the, the the nuns that you've created, and really introduce this that element of menace and th- that element of of sexual tension and so forth into it. So I thought it was a like a really well done chemistry experiment, you know, of introducing these elements. Thank you. Well, yeah, he and he actually has an element too. His element is is metal. Um, so I don't know, which is you know, metal is associated with like basically everything terrible about civilization. Right, right. Mm. Um, so I think he does, he does, like, I mean, that's, he is more than a character. He's like a plot device, um, mm. a very fun to draw plot device. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you, you mentioned his questionable past. One of the things I really did appreciate in this book is the fact that we never learn about his past uh, you know, there's that scene toward the end where uh, Sarai and Afra are about to leave the planet Mopu, and Afra asks Sarai, "You know, did you get the information that you were looking for in terms of uh, Yael and his past?" And she says, "Yes," but then Sarai says, "It doesn't matter now." And mm-hmm. so, not only does Sarai not tell Afra about the information that she has discovered, but she doesn't tell the reader. And so we're left with, uh, you know, this big question mark about Yael Dean. And I like that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm someone who privileges ambiguity and not liking everything spelled out in a narrative. And so, you know, the fact that we still don't know exactly who this character is, um, is something that I very much appreciated in the story. Is that something that you had wanted to do from the beginning to make Yael a mysterious character and never reveal what uh, his past was about? Um, I think that that's some, a decision I made as I went on because, uh, like, I had when I first when I did part one, I knew the kind of broad arc of the story. Uh, and what would happen, but like I wrote each part as I came to it. So the specific scenes and details, um, and like character background, um, is a detail. Um, that's something I kind of worked out as I went on. So 
you know, I did think that early on, I thought that I would get more into his past, but, um, I don't know. I just, I didn't want him to draw too much focus in the story. And, uh, and also I, you know, the difficult part about doing, uh, stories set in created worlds is how do you deal with exposition? Mm. Because you always have to do some, or you have to kind of like give, I mean, <laughs> some people don't, I guess, uh, they like to have that miasma of confusion. Um, but like you have to uh, give the reader some idea of like the rules of the world that the characters are in um, just to, to ground them. And with, and like where the difficulty is finding the balance, like what's enough information that they can, uh, you know, like you, I want to give enough information that they can get into the story and like focus on the characters without getting uh, stopped by like, wondering about how the mechanics of the world work. Right. Um, but I also don't want to go into the point where I'm just having like, you know, too, so much, I, you know, like a, <laughs> you know, like star Wars style, like scroll, you know, like that's, <laughs> I'm trying to avoid that. Um, so, uh, I usually err on the side of like less information, um, rather than more information and I just I as a reader I really hate it when I get hammered over the head with stuff uh mm. and and I not I you know there's no captions so the only way that I can really show that is either in comics would either be with flashbacks which I I don't do in this story or with characters talking um which can also be like a bit ham-fisted so mm. Uh, there's only, I think there's only a couple points where you really have characters talking about like the before period. And I think Afra is generally the one who does that the most. Cause she also kind of like is the one who uh, represents the world they came from the most. She's the one who like says the little cultural aphorisms and like that sort of stuff. But um, I don't know. There is a lot of potential for people like to be unsatisfied or confused uh, about the story, and I think that um, that's an exchange that I willingly made for readers um, like you who uh, who enjoy that kind of ambiguity mm-hmm. and uh, and feel like they would rather they would rather err in that direction than having like this, you know, like this part where like you know coming from X planet where it's, you know like this then <laughs> council members and like then they decided that we're going to expand like it's just no that's not interesting mm-hmm. to me yeah I, I for one think that uh, you walk that tightrope really really well it's a captivating read the world is believable you know you, you take it on its terms and you're you're wrapped immediately into all of the tensions that this uh, you know, the, the particular configurations of this world introduce, uh, which is really great. Can I, I, can I ask at this point, you know, when you were saying, discussing that about making the choices between how much to explain, how much to leave to the reader to, you know, ascertain, it also, it made me wonder if there's kind of a parallel in your decisions about your art style, which I think is wonderfully, it's, it's great. You know, it's, it's really evocative. Um, and there's a kind of a simple minimalism. And also I think, in contrast to the oven where you had, um, I think, you know, some, some gray shade and as well as the use of the orange in the final product, there's like really great and really, really, really impactful black and white that you use. Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about your stylistic, stylistic choices, uh, in house of women and whether that was part of creating that effect that you wanted to create. Yeah, totally. Uh, so, um, so some of these decisions are uh, commerce driven. You know, I'm not mm. the black and white is uh, kind of a necessity when you're doing self publishing, which mm. the right. early mini comics were. Mm. Um, but usually with my other projects, um, even with uh, the the oven originally was like serialized in this maple key comics thing that my friend uh, Joanna McDermott did, and so. Mm. Uh, that was in black and white, but even that I had a gray tone and like most of my stuff, I use tones, um, Mm -hmm. to kind of like add some dimensionality. But, uh, when I was thinking about house of women, I really wanted to, I I wanted to hearken 
to a kind of Art Nouveau style. I, yeah. I had a book of Aubrey Beardsley that I was really in love with. Mm. Um, so I was looking at a lot of that. Uh, and then I also referred to, uh, I have a book of line drawings by Clint, who I really love. Um, and, uh, and so that kind of very strong black and white style was something I really wanted to, to do. Um, and I actually have like, I did like an eight page test of the style, um, very early on. And like in the, in those initial eight pages, like I made everything like even more geometric and flat. Um, and it ended up being like really not fun to draw. So I kind of <laughs> went a little bit more towards back towards like figurative drawing, which was more fun for me. But um, I still like wanted to have it emphasize an, an emphasis on uh, on design in the book. Yeah. So and, and black and white, like it's just it's just it is striking. I think it's pretty yeah. much striking when anyone does it. I'm a huge fan of um uh, you know, Hernandez, the Hernandez brothers mm -hmm. and, um, Jaime Hernandez's work is like a Bible to me. Mm, yeah. Uh, I looked at other stuff that I looked at. Um, I really love, uh, Liz Suburbia. And so I looked mm -hmm. at her. Oh comments. yeah. Her use of black and white is like yeah. very smart. Um, and, uh, and I also, even though these comics are in color, uh, Oh no, I'm going to blank down on his name. Um, you know, the demon guy with the horns that are cut uh, off. Hellboy. Hellboy, Mike Mignola. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. Yes, okay. Uh, yeah, so Mike Mignola also, even though so his comics are colored, but if right. you ignore that, <laughs> right, yeah. Um, he has a very, very strong and very striking use of shadow. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the way he defines the figure um, and is is really interesting so I, I so i had a lot of like um i went through his books and then when i'm trying to like study someone's style um i i will go through the books and then i will like in my notebook i will like copy little sketches out of their things to kind of like figure out the language that they're using to express certain things like okay mm -hmm. this is how they draw like a building and this is how they shadow a face and like mm -hmm. um and so um, and so by doing that, I kind of like would pick up different things from different people that I liked. And I took those and like translated, kind of melded them together into my style. And then, uh, and then I was also for an intern, cause I was going for this Art Nouveau style mm. and, uh, previous to House of Women, I usually worked in a, in a grid. Um, and I don't felt, feel like, uh, the grid format for my panels really suited uh, the Art Nouveau style, mm. um, which tends to be more vertically oriented. Uh, like, and so if you look at old Art Nouveau posters or illustrations, like Mucha is a great example. Everyone knows, like, has seen a lot of Mucha art. Right. Um, like, they tend to be very much longer than they are wide. Um, right. So I wanted to think about how I can uh, orient the panels and the layouts to kind of um, best suit the style. And what I ended up really looking at a lot of was P. Craig Russell. Mm. Uh, he did these wonderful uh, books of uh, that are adaptations of operas. Right. And his layouts were just really so clever and um, creative. And I just ended up studying those books. Yeah, that that's really awesome to hear. Just your rundown, just <laughs> of influences. I can see that so much in the work from the MUCA to uh, P. Craig Russell has this series of videos where he talks about pages from a, a lot of those, you know, those, uh, I'm trying to remember what the names of them, but those operas that he adapted. Mm -hmm. And the thinking, you know, when he sort of reveals his thinking behind those, um, the, the layouts and the, the, the movement of the eye through those pages. Uh, it's great fun. And I, I could, <laughs> I can envision a similar study of your work because I think it's really, really effective uh, in that way. But uh, yeah, so cool. Yeah. I mean, I think as an artist, it's like, I don't know. I mean, I think if I, uh, so comics involves writing and art and like, mm -hmm. I tend to think that I am a, a stronger writer than I am an artist. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
so when I'm when it comes to to drawing and to constructing a layout and things like that, you know, I'm not really trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, but I think, I think, you know, like I, when I am trying to figure out an issue that I'm having on how to represent something, Mm -hmm. like I tend to look at other cartoonists or other artists and see how they've solved this problem. And then, um, and I think house of women, uh, the thing that I did that is potentially interesting about that is not that is that is that I was taking different influences that maybe you don't see as much of in comics. Like yeah. I was looking at so many Japanese prints. Yeah. Um, mm. The way that um, space is used in those uh, prints is really interesting. Right. Um, and the balance of like, you know, the balance of simplicity and detail, like obviously right. in the, in uh, the, uh, Yukioi, I am, I'm terrible pronouncing these things, I have no idea. So Yukioi and Shinhaga period mm. of uh, Japanese art, you see uh, these very simple, like ob- there's a lot of images of the geishas, right. um, and you see these very simple um, figures and faces uh, contrasted with these intensely detailed prints on their right. on their clothing. Mm. Um, and... And I think that that was super, and so that super interesting. So I was trying to bring that into into what I was doing, and I just don't. I've seen some comics that kind of play with that sort of stuff, but I think a lot of a lot of comics tend to reference other comics. Um, yeah, mm. it can be a bit limiting, you know, right. when you see someone like I, I see comics all the time where I'm like, okay, well, I know exactly what he was reading when he made right. this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I, I thought those same things. The um, I, I'm reminded of the sort of um, Japanese paper paper cutting art. You know, the, I think it's called kirigami. Um, in the way that you utilize uh, even I guess foliage, you know, to um, put in in background or sometimes in foreground and to frame certain scenes that are out there in the nature. And at the same time, I see ar- architectural influences, maybe um, the kind of arabesque uh, architecture that all creates a certain uh, atmosphere. And it's, like you said, it's those, it's a combination of those various influences and elements that you, um, I, I think, weave together to create this very effective, uh, you know, uh, sort of otherworldly, but also sort of familiar, it touches off the right notes for us uh, as, as we kind of enter that world with you. That's so cool. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, the first, I don't know, with the, with the castle itself, um, I kind of wanted to get, I think in the first book it looks a little bit more European, and then in the subsequent volumes I tried to move a, away from that a little bit because I wanted the architecture to have to um, to just not look like a like a English castle. Uh, <laughs> I wanted it to be its own kind of thing, um, but I was looking at a lot of like um, uh, is. Islamist architecture mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, was a big part of it, and just like the shapes that you see in the arches and that sort of stuff is um, is different. And you know, having like like there there is one point, Yael is walking through a room, and you see these uh, these native uh, alien women like reclining in a pool in, in an indoor pool, and that's like mm-hmm. not something you see in European architecture. That's like mm-hmm. definitely something you see in uh, in a private home um, mm-hmm. in like Istanbul or something. Mm-hmm. And um, so it's bringing that sort of stuff. Uh, my initial design, I had wanted the castle to be like uh, the Garden of Earthly Delights, uh, Hieronymus mm-hmm. Bosch paint. Mm-hmm. I wanted it to be like that, mm-hmm. but like I was drawing it, and I was like, I really couldn't imagine someone living in one of those structures. <laughs> like they're not like there's no they look like flowers. Like where do people where are the rooms? Like I I just couldn't make it work. <laughs> Sophie, I, I want to go back to the composition of House of Women. One of the things you said a little while ago is that when it comes to certain characters and even scenes, you kind of let it evolve, that you don't necessarily start with a particular endpoint in mind for, let's say, an event or a character, but you just kind of let it play out as you're uh, composing things. And, and 
you also said that the first volume of House of Women that you self-published was done when you were at the Center for Cartoon Studies. I'm wondering how your writing and illustration of the second part and then the more recent third um, kind of changed and evolved as you were going along. Hmm. Um, In your attitude well, toward the, the, the story. Yeah, well, so House of Women is kind of a unique case because um, because I did that part one and then I took two years off before I did part two. I was just a little burnt out after I finished uh, CCS, so I um, spent the next year doing a bunch of short anthology stories. Um, so when I came back to it, I had to, like, I had to really work to get myself back into the world like I rewatched Black Narcissus and I kind of like steeped myself again in the like influences that I had going into the project um so make doing part two and it's also like part two is the middle part and the middle is generally the hardest part of any story um so it was a bit of hard going and like I had a lot of concerns that not enough now, I mean, now it's just a book, like nobody's reading it in separate parts. So it's not something I really have to worry about. But I was a little concerned at the time that like, just not enough happens um, in part two, but I needed uh, a bridge um, from the beginning to the end, essentially. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, it was tough. And, and the kind of like, so it was four years from that it took me to finish the whole book. And, like, I think I'm a very different storyteller now than I was when I started making mm. House of Women. And uh, and it's not, like, necessarily the kind of story that I would write. Like, the kind of stories that I'm working on now are, are very different in nature. Um, like, this kind of, like, gothic horror mm. sci-fi comic might not be something. I, I, I can't think of writing a story like that now. So... It's it's interesting to stick with with something for so long, um, and I guess that's just the process of making graphic novels. Though you kind of like you have this this spark of an idea when you're starting, and you're very excited about it, <laughs> and uh, get very into it. And then at a certain point, you're just like you're just finishing it. <laughs> <laughs> you well, know? Yeah. Well, one of the reasons why I asked the question is that um, I mean, there is a marked difference in tone between, let's say, the first and second parts and then the third part. And, you know, what we see toward the end of part two does lead up to the darker turn that we see in the the final third of the book. Uh, and, and, you know, and there are some darkish moments in the second part. But, I, I mean, I have to tell you, I, I you know, I, I got your self-published original House of Women, part one, and then part two. I never got part three. I don't think I saw you after part three came out. So I didn't read that until this completed book. But I didn't anticipate how things would turn out in part three. Um, but I remember it struck me in reading this completed book from Fantagraphics that it's like, wow, I didn't anticipate a lot of this stuff happening. <laughs> and I mean, there seems to be more black being used, uh, in the third part and uh, without giving anything away, it is rather um, violent and surprising in a variety of different ways. So I, I was wondering about any kind of tonal attitude that you may have had in composing this third part and how it may have been different from, let's say, your earlier storytelling mm. in parts one and two. Well, uh, the the big events of the final part are things that I had always intended to happen. Okay. Mm. Um, I think possibly the way that they came about, um, it's very hard to talk about this without spoilers. <laughs> uh, um, but there, there, so there's some aspects of the, of the scenes that are very like, like horror, like, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and I think that's something that came, uh, that came in later on. Like, uh, when I, when I thought of this, I don't know, should we like, should we just say like, Hey, the spoiler alert, we're going to talk about the ending right now. Like, I really don't know how. Else sure. To do this it. is, this is, is your interview. Okay? You you can call the shots. All right. So for anyone listening to this who's not read the book, uh, you know, 
sorry, turn off your podcast. This is <laughs> we, can, we, can do, yeah. we can do a little time code for folks. But, yeah, uh, fast yeah. forward a few minutes. <laughs> okay. So in the movie uh, Black Narcissist, um, the, so the, the character, so there's um, Sister Claudel, who's kind of the Sarai. She's the headmistress. And then there's mm-hmm. uh, uh, Sister Ruth, who's essentially Rivka. And in the end scene, um, so Sister Ruth tries to push sister Clodo off a cliff and that's what happened. And then she, um, and then in this struggle, she ends up falling to her death. So it's not like, a, you know, keep in mind this movie is made in 1947. It's not a very graphic death. Yeah. Um, unlike what I did, where she gets <laughs> impaled through the head is right. very different. Um, so I think that, uh, like I knew that she was, that character was going to die, but I hadn't quite, figured out how and I hadn't really brought Zaza into it in my initial idea but I was just like I knew I wanted the scene to to be um I wanted it to be horrifying Mm. and when I had the idea of like you know like so there's an earlier scene with Zaza and Kizzy where he kind of like you know like he's just basically a giant hormone monster Mm. and he and he unintentionally intentionally kills her right. and then uh and then when i was thinking about the ending i was like well okay so we already basically this works great this is like foreshadowing of what you know he shows up at this end and i think it was great because it brought him back into it um as as a character and that tied him uh and rivka together in this kind of like fomenting world that they're in mm. and and i just and the visual of his uh talon like coming like the confusion of the moment where you like it looks like it's her tongue um and when i and then you find and then you turn the page and you see it's his it's his talon like i showed i showed a couple people the pencils and they had that that like like (laughs) i reaction is like yes this is it (laughs) that's what i really wanted from people and it was like oh so much fun to draw like those final scenes were like the most fun I had of drawing of like the entire book. I felt like I was waiting for years to get to the point where I was drawing those pages. Um, and like, you know, to me, I'm just like, I love horror movies. I'm a horror mm. fan. Like some of it is just stuff that I just really wanted to have in there. But I think it does, it does work on a, on a story level up to a certain point, but like, you know, sometimes when you're as a as an artist and as a writer, like you want to write things that you want to draw, and like I did want to draw that a graphic horror scene. Mm. It was it was just so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> it shows that you're having fun. It's it's riveting <laughs> and <laughs> unforgettable. Really, some of those moments. Um, but yeah, even even when uh, Rivka starts to have trees growing out of her head, you know, sort of in in a in a really symbolic image, and then when she you know kind of meets the watery end uh, where she uh, she she's sort of her body's being sent off, all that those images are just uh, so evocative. It's 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 awesome. Yeah, she's she's actually my favorite character. Rivka. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, she is like the most fun of all the characters to draw Um, because her like when a, so when I'm drawing characters, I tend like with, uh, with the oven, uh, like the characters faces are all very simple. And, and I, it's kind of like a Scott McCloud thing. Like I think the, I do kind of agree that the simpler the face, the more the reader puts into it and like identifies with that character and puts himself inside there. And I, and I also think like in an emotional scene, um, I tend to have my characters under emote because then I think the reader does the emotional work. Mm. Um, like when you have a blank face, you know, but you know, from the story, you know how that character is feeling in that moment. It actually, it it hurts more as a reader. And this is how I feel reading other things like, you know, I tend to like really feel for rep- repressed characters. I don't know what that says about me. <laughs> um, so with Sarai's character, she's the viewpoint character and her yeah. face is the simplest face and also mm-hmm. the least emotive. Um, I mean, I guess Afro doesn't emote a ton, but like um, 
she's so Sarai is kind of like she's like the least fun to draw and I would always like I'd be like tweaking her eyes like a millimeter it was just so annoying um but Mm. with Rivka because she's not the viewpoint character and she's kind of you know she's the antagonist I could just like get super elastic with her um and make her kind of like monstrous um and that's that was what was so much fun to draw about her like that Mm. sort of that sort of elasticity that you get. I think you can be very elastic with horror and you can be very elastic with comedy um, and really push expressions with comedy. But um, for with serious, serious drama, um, I tend to go more towards um, being very restrictive mm. in facial expressions, um, which I think could be effective, but like not, it's just not as much fun to draw. Like um, mm-hmm. the oven is overall not as much fun to draw as house of women was. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned um, character style and and then Scott McCloud, because I hadn't thought of this before you mentioned this. It it, it it really is interesting that I guess two characters that are diametrically opposed would be Kizzy and Rifka. And Rifka's features, mm. especially her fe- facial features, but also other parts of her anatomy, especially her hands, you draw with these really sharp angles – um, very pointed, whereas Kizzy is rounded, uh, both mm-hmm. literally and figuratively, right? She is kind of a, um, you know, plump character, but also uh, her nose, her overall head, her chin, they're very rounded. So you don't have the pointedness as you do, do with Rivka. And, you know, that makes sense. That tells us something about their character. And I guess the best example of a blank slate, uh, you know, a la. Uh, Scott McCloud is Sarai. Uh, she's someone, and, and you know, your protagonist that the reader can maybe most identify with. Um, mm-hmm. And she is the most, I don't know, we want to call it nondescript in terms of features of uh, mm-hmm. the four women. Yeah. And, and she's, she's definitely designed that way. I mean, it's difficult. There's so much now it's, it's, you know, like when it, Mm, Cause this gets into the discussion of uh, like default things. Like when you have it, like mm-hmm. the, there's a big discussion going on in comics in general right. and writing in general about like the default white guy that being a white male is like being like being nothing. And then sure. if you make it a woman, then it's a female character. If you make it a black woman, it's black female character. Right. Um, and you get more specific, the more you move away from white male. And like, so there's something I'm very conscious of like saying that Sarai is like, a blank slate for the reader to identify with like, uh, you know, I'm a white woman. Um, but like that might not be true for everyone, but it, I, so, so that, I guess that's my caveat about this whole (laughs) discussion, but, um, purposely making her features very simplistic. Like that was what I was going for. Um, I'm not sure like now when I design characters, I think I think about this sort of stuff more and I'm like, and I also, I'm very tired of drawing this like, like <laughs> g- generic female face. Um, so I'm kind of moving away from that. But in terms of her, in in terms of her, the mobility of her face, like that was, mm. that was a, a conscious decision that I made. And like, if you look at the Evan, um, Sid, the female character in that, I think there's, uh, there's like, she, she and, uh, Sarai kind of look kind of similar. So it was just like, I guess like in my, in my head canon, that's like a default human being is like this, like <laughs> generically pretty, like white girl is like what I have in my head. Um, but, uh, I don't know. So, mm. so that's what I got. I think it, but at the <laughs> same time, like, you know, I, I do have, I think that because they're women, like sometimes readers, uh, male readers are resistant to identifying with women. So even mm. though, um, even though I kind of, the, my idea is that the, you know, like sexuality is not a female issue. It's a human issue and like mm. desire and things like that. So I, I feel like a male reader should be able to read this book and identify with these female characters. But memorably, I had a classmate <laughs> uh, at CCS who like, so the title of the book is house of women. And, um, and I, we were going over our stuff in class and he was like, um, you know, like I, re- I didn't think that I would uh, be interested in a book called House of Women, but I really enjoyed this. 
I was like, yeah. well, all right, I guess I should just be prepared for that response. <laughs> like, that's actually the best case scenario of that response. Like, um, I'm sure there's lots of people who won't pick up the book because it's a book called How Someone Can Buy a Female Author. But I don't know. I'm not like, whatever. It's just. Yeah. We're not interested in those, those yeah. people reading anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of like. It's just a, it's a complicated issue um, yeah. and representing human experience is complicated and who you choose to cast and all these sorts of things. And when you get into science fiction, there's also, um, his science, science fiction is a genre where basically like there's a, there's these tropes in science fiction um, where you have like subjugated white characters, they're enslaved by alien races. So basically mm-hmm. like co-opting um the narratives of minorities especially in america and then like taking those and like applying them to like white people and that's that's very problematic so i do kind of think about these things when i'm doing science fiction um and i try to and i'm trying to participate in these larger conversations that are happening in science fiction but it's a it's it's all it's just all very it's very interesting. It's very complicated and mm-hmm. it's still developing. And I think yeah. that probably the, the answer isn't anything that I'm going to do. It's just the, the more getting more voices and having more people do science fiction is really the answer. Yeah. 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 And I think as well, you know, when I think about the four characters, it did strike me that, as you mentioned earlier, you're building on archetypes. They're very recognizable personalities, which is efficient for storytelling purposes. But the question for me is to what extent are these people not only representing these characters representing themselves, but representing the boxes that have been placed around them. And, you know, there's a, I kept thinking of the handmaid's tale, um, uh, as I was thinking about these characters, because you can see them voicing not only, uh, aspects of their personality. And by the way, it's speaking of identification. I think I'm a Kizzy through and through. <laughs> I, I identify a lot with Kizzy, but you know, there's not only their personalities, but there's very much like, how they've been treated by the empire their whole lives, you know, or what box they've been put in. And, you know, to me, there's a, I, I sympathize to some extent, even with, with, with Rivka, you know, with the extent to which, uh, the story is a, is an interrogation of where there's space or isn't space for her desire, you know, or her Mm -hmm. sexuality. And so to me, it's really in the interplay of all those things of ways that, um, expectations are laden on these women, uh, ways they they have to carry out and perform these roles out in the quote unquote field, and then how that all gets sort of mixed up in the uh, uh, all of the tension with uh, with the setting and with with Yale that um, makes it fascinating to me. Makes it more than just repeating some types, you know. Well, that's all very great for me to hear as an author. <laughs> Yeah. I liked it. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Now, now, Sophie, um, you know, as I mentioned, I've got the first two self-published installments of House of Women. I don't have the third, unfortunately. Um, and I've recently moved, so I have those two self-published works packed away somewhere. I wasn't able to find them and to fish them out before this interview, because one of the things I wanted to do is to compare the finished book with the Fanographics book that just came out last week with um, your previously self self published volumes because I wanted to see if there were any changes between what you originally put out with uh, the you know the separate self published House of Women mm. uh, selections and the Fanographics book. Is there any difference, or basically have you taken what you originally self published and then in essence put it together, and that's what uh, Fanographics has put out now? Um. In terms of the the guts, the story itself, uh, it's there are not any major changes. I did go back and do some some light editing. You know, I kind of like cleaned up messy lines and um, smears that I had overlooked, and I think there might even be some spelling errors that somehow made it through <laughs> multiple years of printing. Um, so the anyone who's bought and collected the mini comics has this has the story Mm -hmm. um and you know when people come up to me at shows and they ask like i I tell them like you are you have the story um the main changes uh that were made are the packaging uh you know the cover the end papers and then uh because because it was originally published in three parts i did um i have 
part one, part two, and part three a little like, you know, separating chapter headings. And so um, there's original art on those. There's a title page. Of course, the whole cover has been redesigned and end papers. And, and like, I, you know, I know a lot of people who collected the mini comics. Um, one of the things they really enjoyed about it was the design of the mini comics. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't want to. And the covers. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I didn't want to. Um, I didn't want to just replicate that or try to replicate that for a mass printed book. I really wanted to do something that would be um, different. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so what I ended up going back to is I have, um, I think like I had originally, it was just like files on my computer of images I'd found on Google image search. And uh, then it was like a Pinterest page of just, covers that are from the lady book covers from the late 1800s to the early like 1890s to 1910s art nouveau period essentially um and kind of like figuring out the different elements and i very early on had found this um this cover by alexander Claire uh uh that i can't remember the name of the book but um so basically it had the same kind of like layout as the cover for the fanographics edition it had mm-hmm. a long little title panel and then there is a figure of a woman um and she was like standing next to um a, like a tall ground mounted candle and it was a very simple line drawing and i really liked um the kind of balance of the image. So uh, very, very early on before part one even came out, I had collected all of my concept art into like a shitty little mini comic. (laughs) And I had drawn a version of, of that with rip with uh, Sarai um, Mm. for the mini comic cover. And so when it came time to do the fan and graphics book, I did like a bunch of thumbnails of different ideas, but I really like still liked this original idea of, uh, of this, you know, bounce is Sarai holding a candle with a castle in the background. And then you have the, like the title, the long title panel. And, um, so I just, I just reworked that. I like redrew it, um, and, um, played around with like, uh, so many different balances of gold and black and red and white and like, um, a bit and like sent those back and forth with er- Eric Reynolds and, and Keely, McCarthy, who's the production designer, and, like, eventually, by committee, landed on, like, a a good balance. But, like, um, yeah, so that was kind of the the process. Like, what I I want the, I want the book to have the feel of an older book. Um, Mm. And then I tried to inject some of the science fiction, like, you know, I, I, I think it would be nice if people picking up the book realized it was science fiction, but you know, if they turn to the front first page, they're going to get that anyway. (laughs) Um, but the, the things that I have like on the spine, you have the planet and and the Moku and the, and the starscape. And then on the, her candle, there's like the rays coming out of the candle are full bleed. And I think that's, that's like a a little modern touch that you wouldn't get in those older books. Um, so those were some of the things that I was trying to bring in to like make it uh, a, like a an early 1900s looking book with a couple little touches that would mm. that would modernize it. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. Now, you know, your original House of Women, which again you published in three parts, you self published. Uh, your previous book, The Oven, which we've mentioned a few times, came out from Ad House. Now, this new book, The Completed House of Women, came out from Fantagraphics, and I'm curious how this publisher came about. I mean, did you seek out Fantagraphics? Did Gary Groth seek you out? Uh, (laughs) Did you decide from the get-go that you wanted Fantagraphics and, let's say, not Ad House uh, to come out with a completed House of Women? In other words, what's the the story on uh, your relationship with Fantagraphics as a publisher? Um, Well... Uh, so I had long, so the first volume of, uh, House of Women came out in 2013. Uh, the oven came out in 2015. So I had been giving, uh, these mini comics to Gary Roth for every time a new one came out, I would give them to him and he expressed positive emotions about them. (laughs) Um, you know, and Fanographics is 
is a is a dream publisher for me. So I I, I felt like this story um, fitted more with Fanographics than with any other publisher that I could think of. Um, you know, it's kind of in the wheelhouse of things that they do. So I did really want the book to land with them. Um, and it was a little bit, I mean, no, he didn't like, he didn't come to me with a contract. I like basically stocked Fanographics. <laughs> um, that's, I think that's more true to the experience of publishing in general than the opposite. Um, unless someone's much, uh, more talented and fortunate than I am. But, um, yeah, so it was, uh, it was basically like, you know, giving, I gave them mini comics for years and then I sent a pitch and then I emailed them a bunch and like, you know, I, I kind of, I, I just wait, I, I was like, if they, if they're not going to publish it, I just want to hear a no. Mm. Um, you know, so that's, and they didn't say no. So that was, that's kind of this, the short version of the story. And I've told that to other people who've been trying to like pitch their books to publishers, you know, publishers are very busy and, um, you know, like just a lack of response isn't necessarily a no. Sometimes it's just a lack of response. So especially if you have a strong history, you know, you have a, if you have a strong pitch, like you're not just like someone who wandered into comics like a couple months ago that you've been self-publishing for years and you have a fully formed book and everything like, mm. you know, I think trying to pursue it to the point of where you get a definitive answer is, is worth it. I mean, it was worth it in my case. Um, with ad house, it was, it was, a, it was a bit different. I had been um, giving my mini comics to Chris Pitzer for a long time. Um, and he, uh, at one point he was like, well, if you ever interested in pitching your book, you know, hit me up. And I is like, oh, uh, so I remember that obviously, like, how do you forget someone telling you that? Um, so when it came time for me to, to when the oven was in a position to be pitched people, I did, I, I sent, he was the first person I sent it to and he said, yes. So, uh, uh but I think, um, ad house is a special case, like his, Spitzer's mission is to foster emerging talent, mm. um, which is a, a wonderful mission uh, for a publisher to have. So um, that was the oven was the right book in the right place at the right time for 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 him. Um, and I had a wonderful experience with him, and I've had a great experience with fan graphics. I think I've been very fortunate. Well, tell us um, as, as much as you can. You, if you don't want to give anything away, we'd understand. What what project or projects are you working on now? Um, I have a book, a graphic novel that is in in process. It's completely scripted, um, and as soon as I'm done with like uh, the season of book touring and promotion and conventions, which basically ends, uh, at Thanksgiving, then I'll be jumping into drawing it. And the, it's a collaborative. So I had done this web comic years ago called during Crime Girl is going to hell, uh, that I had a co-written with, uh, my friend Jen Jordan. So yeah, yep. yeah it's been a long, long time. So, uh, but we had wanted to do, uh, another project together. So, uh, so this is that project. Like we wrote the whole story. It's very much, it's in the tone of Darren Carmichael in that it's, um, it's a lighter comedy set in, um, you know, uh, it's, it's set in a kind of magical world, but one that's pretty close to ours. Um, so, uh, so then that book, uh, so, so that's the, that's the new project. So it's that it's cool. that tone, uh, but combined with like, uh, you know, an actual structured story, unlike a <laughs> comic, which is just like kind of a, you know, a shaggy dog story. Uh, so I think it, I think it's, I think it'll be really great. I'm very much looking forward to drawing uh, a comedy. It's been a really long time. Now, is this going to be for intended for print, or is it going to be like Darwin Carmichael is going to hell? Are you going to start off as a webcomic? Well, um, it is going to be uh, published in print, um, but I will be serializing it on my Patreon. 
for my subscribers because ah. yeah, I mean, it won't come out until uh, winter 2019. Uh, that's the projected publishing date now. And like somehow I need to pay rent between now and then. So I'm <laughs> hoping that we'll get enough people who are interested in following it on the Patreon and kind of like getting it as I'm working on it. Um, so, and I already got the okay to do that. So that's the, that is the plan. And, you know, and it'll be, and it'll be fun because it's been a long time since I've had um, something where people can, uh, give me feedback as I'm, as I'm producing it. Uh, so that'll be enjoyable too. And we should mention that, uh, people can check out your Patreon account by going to www.patreon.com slash Sophie Goldstein, one word. So patreon.com slash Sophie Goldstein and our listeners can check out and we hope support you on Patreon. That would be rad. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Sophie, we're so glad that you were able to come on the show today and talk with us about House of Women and, and, and your work in general. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, this was huge fun, and your work is awesome. And if people have listened this far and haven't picked up the book, uh, what's wrong with you? Go get the book. It's <laughs> yeah. really good. Come on, get with the, get with the game. <laughs> Pull over the car. Go to your nearest uh, right. book outlet. Stop everything now. It. Yeah, or yeah. pull out your smartphone and uh, go to the Amazon <laughs> site and order it now. Now, now. <laughs> no, but thank and you then, so much uh, for, for this conversation. I It's cool to get go deep with this uh, stuff with you. Well, thanks. Thank you. I'm, thank you for reading and taking the time. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Sophie. All right. Bye, guys. Well, Derek, I, I want to thank you because, wow, so much fun. So cool that I could uh, come in on this conversation with um, with Sophie Goldstein. And uh, I thought that that was so enlightening, uh, her, her talking about some of her influences and inspirations and some of her thinking behind uh, different decisions in making House of Women, which, you know, I, w I will say once again, uh, without her present, that uh, I really, really enjoyed. Yes, I did too, uh, as I enjoyed the conversation. Uh, you know, I always like talking with Sophie. Uh, mm. And you're right, this conversation, as you pointed out at the beginning of this episode, uh, was a very deep dive into the process and the genesis of House of Women. Mm. Uh, so I, I, I very much appreciated that part of the conversation. But another thing that was enjoyable is the fact that Sophie is just such a pleasant creator to talk with. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's. It, we talked to a lot of people on the Comics Alternative, and I, I don't want to say that not all of them are as pleasant, but they're not as accommodating as Sophie is. And mm -hmm. so uh, I want to thank her for for coming on and talking with us about this, uh, because I, I think both of us had a really good time. Yeah, absolutely. Combination of generosity and genius. That's pretty great. That's right. <laughs> You know, and if you want to find great comics like the kind that Sophie produces, then mm -hmm. you would do well to check out the website of our sponsor, which is Discount Comic Book Service. Now, unfortunately, none of her books are available on DCB Service, nor are in stock trades. Mm. Um, but other great comics you can find, that's DCBService.com. And after you do get your titles there, get in touch with us and let us know what you're reading. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned, antiquated way by picking up a telephone and dialing 4153-COMICS. <laughs> That's 4153266427. You can also email us at two guys, T W O guys, at comicsalternative.com, or reach us individually at Derek at comicsalternative.com, or me, Paul, at Paul at comicsalternative.com. That's right. You can also reach out to us via social media. We're all over the place, <laughs> such as Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on TuneIn, on iHeartRadio, on Google Play Music, and on Spotify. But you can find every single one of our episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, which is comicsalternative.com. 
That's right. So until next time, I'm Paul. And I'm Derek. We'll talk at you later. (laughs) Bye-bye.